big deal. Uh, fisheries Division does a, uh, produces a lot of fish. We have six cold water fish hatcheries uh, located throughout the state, two in the UP and four on the western side of the lower peninsula. Uh, we operate six different uh, salmon weirs, three of which are used for egg collection for salmon and steelhead. Uh, we have over 30 walleye ponds that are operated by uh, fish production staff, field staff, and, and many that are operated in conjunction with various sportsmen group, sportsmen's groups around the state. Uh, and two cooperative hatcheries that are operated throughout the state, one with Lake Superior State University and another one that is a uh, sturgeon facility uh, where we raise uh, sturgeon in conjunction with Michigan State University and uh, uh, the Sturgeon for Tomorrow group. Uh, and we have, have a couple of uh, streamside sturgeon trailers that are located uh, in different places around the state as well. So why do we stock fish in Michigan? There's four primary reasons to stock fish. Uh, first is to provide ecosystem balance. The best example of that would be when Pacific salmon were brought into the state to try and, and get the alewife population. So as we think about rearing fish in our different facilities, we don't just randomly draw a species out of the hat uh, for what's going to be reared in which hatchery. We, there's a lot of things that have gone into consideration. Uh, the primary factors though are water temperature and water quality. Uh, and uh, along with that, fish health considerations. And there's, there's more secondary factors too that are, that are important but not quite, don't quite rise to the level of water temperature and fish health concerns. And those include such things as transportation logistics, which I'll talk about in a little bit further later in my discussion, and uh, various other hatchery logistics. Um, so our uh, water supply, the water that's available, as I said, really kind of drives the decisions that we, of what's going to be raised where. Uh, so I'm going to give a little overview of the water supplies that are available for each of our hatcheries. Uh, Marquette has uh, Marquette Hatchery, which uh, not surprisingly is located in Marquette. I'm going to go through these starting in the north part of the state, work south. Uh, Marquette is on surface water, one of two of our facilities that are on surface water. Uh, they have some well water, but most of their water is from Cherry Creek. Uh, they have about 10,500 10, gallons per minute of water available. We don't necessarily use that much all the time, but uh, that water, because it's surface water, is subject to whatever Mother Nature throws at it, uh, temperature-wise. And temperature drives, in large part, what we do with these facilities. And we don't have the ability to change water temperature at that facility. Uh, Thompson Hatchery uh, is on virtually all well water. We've got a little bit of artesian spring water there, but almost all well water. About 3,100 gallons per minute in total. And that includes two deep geothermal wells. Uh, when I say deep, I'm talking about 2,000 feet deep, so they're very deep wells. Uh, that deeper water is, is warmer uh, than, than the three shallow wells that we have, and that allows us, by mixing water, to have a little bit more flexibility in, in trying to hit a specific target temperature. Uh, I should mention, too, that uh, Thompson was just recently uh, identified to receive a significant chunk of capital outlay money in the FY17 budget, so we're going to hopefully add another geothermal well there to possibly to hopefully uh, increase our, our large steel and capacity at Thompson. <coughs> Odin Hatchery has five wells. It's a 100% well water. Um, they don't have any geothermal wells, uh, so they uh, just are subject to the constant temperature of the water coming out of the aquifer um, and really minimal ability to change the temperature. We do have a couple of small boilers and a couple of chillers, but that only allows us to do very, a very small portion of our early rearing area or our incubation water. Uh, Platte River Hatchery uh, is our second facility that's on, on surface water and has 100% surface water. We have no well water in Platte. Uh, we have available to us 20,000 gallons a minute, or excuse me, 20,000 gallons per minute of, of water from the three different water sources that we have. That's Brundage Spring Pond, uh, Brundage Creek, and the Platte River. Uh, and we do have the ability to change water temperature there. We have a very large, very expensive to operate boiler. Um, Harrietta, uh, not too far from, from uh, Flat River Hatchery, located in Wexford County, just west of, of Cadillac, has about 4,000 gallons per minute available from the four wells that they have, uh, and absolutely no ability to change temperature there at all. They don't have any boiler or chiller, so they're subject to whatever the aquifer temperature is. And then finally, our southernmost hatchery, uh, Wolf Lake Hatchery, has about 2,500 gallons per minute of well water available. It's a little bit warmer than the well water in the other parts of the state, so that allows us to raise different species there. Um, I have a note on there that they need to degas that well water to get rid of the nitrogen. That's actually true for any, virtually any well water that we use at any of our facilities. So it's just another thing that that, uh, that we have to contend with. Uh, and Wolf Lake does have, have a boiler and chiller, so they have the ability to manipulate, manipulate
delay water temperature to uh, some degree. Um, temperatures that we have at our facilities, Marquette, because they're uh, on that surface water, that water temperature ranges from 34 degrees to 51 degrees uh, throughout the year. We, it's not unheard of for the raceways outside to freeze over in an, an extremely cold year. That happened here a couple of years back. Well, Perrietta um, is a great facility. It's very steady, very efficient. Constant water temperatures. We've really got that place figured out. They're in a, in a really good groove right now. Uh, brown trout and rainbow trout production. Water is really too cold for the warmer species. We could potentially talk about other species there, but uh, with, for instance, if we wanted to raise more steelhead, Harriet's come up before for that as a, as a possibility. If those water temperatures are just too cold to be able to get those steelhead up to smolting size by stocking season. Um, Wolf Lake has some temperature flexibility, uh, mostly in the early rearing uh, part of the uh, facility. Uh, and uh, focus there is, is steelhead and Chinook. Uh, they also are the, right now the major player in our cool water program, so they produce walleyes, uh, northerns, and muskies, although because it's not a true honest to goodness cool water facility, that's not what it was designed for. We don't have the capacity, uh, either staff-wise or facility-wise, to do both <coughs> muskie and northerns at the same time. Uh, fish health is another thing I mentioned as one of our primary uh, driving factors in making decisions of what's going to be raised where. Uh, we, we, make a, we have captured brood stocks that we have an awful lot of time and, and and effort and you can convert that into dollars uh, invested in those brood stocks. Uh, and we make a very strong, uh, concerted effort to try and protect the fish health status of those captive brood stocks. Uh, so we try and keep them separate from our Great Lakes species. Um, wild brood stocks are, are known to, uh, they can carry a wide range of pathogens that they, that they may bring in so that when you bring, collect eggs from feral brood, you have the chance that you may be bringing in pathogens that we want to keep out of those of those captive broods, so so we keep them separate. Uh, so with that being said, our Great Lakes fish fishes those those that are uh, eggs are collected from feral stock that return that would be our, our Atlantic salmon, coho salmon, chinook, and steelhead uh, are restricted to uh, Wolf Lake hatchery, Thompson hatchery, and Platte River State fish hatchery. So some of the other secondary care uh, blood curve factors that go into deciding what's going to be raised where uh, some of these kind of seem like no-brainers and they probably are. Transportation logistics. It makes a lot of sense to raise fish as close as possible to the stocking location so you can minimize not only the cost of, of hauling fish, but the, the cost of those fish of having to haul them long distances. The longer you have to haul them, uh, the more stress it creates. So the closer they are to their, their stocking site is to their rearing site, the more we can minimize that, that stress and that can only serve to, uh, to help post-stocking survival. Um, other things that we have to consider, uh, the different uh, mix of species and, and life stages. Uh, it's not always as simple as, uh, certainly everybody has heard there's some discussion going on right now about possibly reducing the number of Chinook that are going to be stocked into Lake Michigan. Maybe that will be discussed in our next uh, agenda item. Um, if we go ahead and make that decision and we pull a number of, of Chinook out of production, it's not as simple as saying, well, there's, there's extra hat or raceway space that's been opened up by removing those Chinook from production. Let's produce more steelhead in there. Uh, there's different life stage issues that you need to look at there, or life history issues. We only raise Chinook for six months in the hatchery system. Uh, Stockton is a much smaller uh, smolt as opposed to steelhead, which are there for, or coho, which are there for 14 to 18 months uh, and, and go out as a much larger uh, smolt. Uh, we also have uh, effluent limitations that we need to take into consideration that especially comes into play at Platte River State Fish Hatchery. You may or may not have heard, have some history with the, uh, uh, the two decade or more long court battle that we had with the Platte Lake Improvement Association over some issues that were related to our effluent from the Platte River Hatchery. Uh, we've since entered into a settlement with them and we're doing real good at meeting all the all the permit limitations that are part of that settlement, uh, but anytime we talk about adding anything to plat, we have to think about that. What's what is the possibility that, uh, or what are the potential implications of adding something to plat to those uh, to that effluent? Um, and cost, of course, is another another thing that we always try to take into consideration. Um, and again, that's mostly related to the heating and chilling of water. That is not a cheap proposition. Uh, changing the changing the the temperature just a degree or two on. What might be a plat, for instance, 7 million gallons of water per day. Uh, that 
is an expensive proposition. So we try and move the fish to the right spot so that, that we're able to do it in the, in the cheapest way possible, or the most cost-effective way possible. Uh, so, so we've gone through a whole lot of years of fishery. We've been in the business for a long time. Uh, and and the, the rearing assignments that we have now are really the result of essentially 135 years of fishery experience and, and experimentation with different species at different facilities. Uh, and over that time, we've tried just about every possible combination you can think of. Uh, and, and the lessons that we've learned over all that time have really gotten us to where we are now with the, with the uh, current rearing assignments that we have. Um, so in summary, I'm starting to repeat myself here a little bit, but a lot of things have to be considered when we're making our rearing assignments. And we rely on our experience over, not just our experience, but that of our predecessors as well. Uh, and our number one job is always producing healthy fish that have a good opportunity to survive after stocking so that they can contribute to sustainable fisheries for the anglers of the state of Michigan, which is the, the group that funds us in large part. So with that, I think I'm going to probably put questions off until Jim is done with his uh, portion of the presentation, and then we'll, uh, we'll leave some time for, for you folks to uh, ask whatever questions you might have with the both of us.